organizers for uh, inviting me along and, and through me the European Anti-Poverty Network to have a chance to link in with some of your thinking about outing exclusion or at least how to start talking about um, uh, outing exclusion. The European Anti-Poverty Network was set up by local community organizations all over Europe to find ways to try to make an impact on national policies and European policies which affect the lives of people who are, are uh, living in poverty uh, for different reasons and to try to put poverty at the top of both the national uh, and the European agenda. I'm going to start uh, maybe with uh, Davin's question. Davin's question was, um, uh, I suppose, goes right to the core of the work which we try to do in the European Anti-Poverty Network in terms of influencing uh, uh, policy on poverty. And the question was uh, whether um, the European and the, and the Irish national anti-poverty strategies and social inclusion strategies uh, can um, make a difference to uh, uh, the lives of LGBT people and, can, and, and whether those frameworks can uh, address uh, or eliminate poverty and exclusion in those groups. And the very simple answer to that is no. Uh, the European uh, and social inclusion strategy, the Irish national anti-poverty <coughs> strategy, have not delivered an end to poverty, social exclusion, discrimination for people living in disadvantaged areas in Ireland or elsewhere in Europe. They have not delivered significant change for Irish travellers. They have not delivered significant change for homeless people uh, in Ireland or across Europe. What they have done is they've given us some of the information, some of the, uh, some of the tools, uh, some of the levers, if you like, which can be used to fight poverty if and when there is a political will to fight poverty and if and when we are organised and strong enough to force that political will and to create change, both in terms of the work we do uh, in our own communities, and that's what a lot of the discussions today have been about, the work which people are doing um, to address poverty within our own communities, and also in terms of the bigger policy issues where we try to make our voices heard. So I think it's very important to start by saying that <coughs> anti-poverty strategies, whether Irish or European, are not about delivering change, but they are about giving us some of the information, uh, some of the visibility, some of the instruments which can be used. But we have to take them up, we have to use them, and we have to force more powerful interests in society to take those issues seriously. And this is why the question of information is so important. And looking at preparing for this conference, uh, looking over the information available about poverty and social exclusion and LGBT community and communities, um, it became very clear that there's relatively little information out there. There's relatively few facts and figures. Uh, for example, if you look up the word poverty on the website of ILGA Europe, which is normally the best source of information, not only um, for uh, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender issues, but also one of the best sources of information on the European Union and how to influence policy, you'll find only three publications, uh, three links come up. The first is a link to my own organisation, the European Anti-Poverty Network, which in turn, I will admit straight out, says very little about LGBT issues. Uh, the second is a link to the study which was taken, which took place here in Ireland, which has been referred to a number of times uh, back in 1995, uh, supported by the Combat Poverty Agency, which I'll come back to. And the third is to a useful recent study in the United States. So this, and searching around, this comes quite close to being the sum total of the information about <laughs> poverty, social exclusion, as it affects LGBT individuals and communities uh, within the European continent. It doesn't quite sum it up, but it comes quite close to it. And if we're going to start to talk about uh, mainstream, if you like, LGBT issues into discussions about poverty in Ireland and in Europe, we do need that information. That information alone won't solve the problems. We have endless information about child poverty in Ireland, endless strategies, endless policy documents, and yet, uh, this week we saw figures showing that in the last four years, child poverty um, deprivation rates actually doubled in this country in spite of those strategies and information. But it will give us somewhere to start talking from. It will also give us 
uh, a space where different organizations with different perspectives, different community work groups working in different ways to address poverty, discrimination, equality, and so on, can discuss issues uh, and can work together. One of the main distinctions between the way the European Union and Ireland have tackled the issues of um, poverty and social exclusion and the issues around discrimination and equality is that the anti-poverty strategies have no legal teeth. The LGBT uh, organisations in Ireland, I think, have been very effective. Though I know most discussion today has been about what still needs to be done, but have been effective um, in forcing legal change in Ireland, changes around anti-discrimination policy, changes around equality policy, changes uh, challenging uh, the direct persecution of people for uh, their sexual orientation. Within the anti-poverty uh, uh, anti strategies are largely a matter of policy frameworks which are used for guidance, they're used for reference, but don't have the same legal force as anti-discrimination. Uh, measure. So it is very important that the two ways of thinking, the two ways of working, which exist side by side within government as much as they do within the NGO community, need to learn from each other and need to work together. The information which is available, uh, as I say, a lot of it comes from a 20-year-old study from the Combat Poverty Agency. And looking at that study again, digging it out before this conference, I recognised a lot of names who were involved in that study, both in commissioning and writing it, were still involved very heavily involved in activism uh, in Ireland. But nevertheless, that study was carried out 20 years ago. It's, it starts in its introduction and its forward as describing itself as being a contribution to the National Anti-Poverty Strategy, which was being written at the time. And as Davin pointed out earlier, the anti-poverty strategy doesn't mention any of the three words which are driving this conference, lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. In fact, the study itself, I don't think, uses the word transgender at all, but that's something to do with its timing. Um, the American studies, there's quite a lot of information coming out of America, and what we learned from that are a series of questions more than a series of answers. One of the differences between the information available in the US and the Common Poverty Study is the US tries to base its information on broader cross-sections of society, mostly census information, census data of one type or another, and, and household surveys, um, whereas the CPA study was more of a voluntary response uh, uh, study looking at a number, I think about 150, 155 uh, individuals. What we do learn from that though is that we, we need to look, as you would expect, very closely at the ways in which what the CPA study calls discrimination and the fear of discrimination have affected the ability of people to stay in education, which is a very major factor contributing to poverty, have, have affected the, um, we need to look at the way in which the um, uh, discrimination, fear of discrimination and homophobia generally in society has affected people in the workplace, people leaving work and both the American studies and the CPA study show considerable, uh, uh, so very, very high figures for the um, number of people who have either been sacked from their work or have resigned from work because of the um, uh, because of the fear of discrimination or simply because of the fear of homophobia generally uh, in the workplace. <coughs> we need to look particularly, um, as, as I know uh, a lot of the campaigns around civil partnership and marriage equality are looking at the moment, at the effects on children. The US study shows, for example, that children of lesbian couples are considerably, in fact twice as uh, likely to fall below the US poverty line as the, um, the uh, as those of heterosexual couples. So the same isn't so true of gay men. We also need to look at diversity, not just diversity of communities, we've been talking about, about a lot here today, but geographical diversity, the way in which different societies uh, and different areas have uh, not only different politics and different legislation, but also different cultures. And within the US study, for example, they found that many of the indicators of poverty in the LGBT community were far, far less on the West Coast than on the East Coast, but there is no explanation or no deeper analysis as to why that's the case. And that's something we also need to look at within Europe and even within Ireland. We talked a bit today about uh, urban and rural differences. We need to look at um, the way in which uh, 
uh, the extent to which changing social attitudes have affected um, exclusion, and the extent to which um, changes in the law, and uh, uh, particularly around uh, status and around uh, relationships, uh, has been uh, has affected the changing levels of uh, poverty, um, both in Ireland and across Europe. And as I say, there is very little information in this area, very few studies. Uh, I remember, just, just from my own memory, I remember about 10 years ago that the Combat Poverty Agency had planned a follow-up study. Uh, I was in touch with the former CPA official who commissioned that, uh, and is now living in London, about that, and uh, I haven't managed to get uh, in touch to get, a, to get an answer back as to what happened to that study, but the, there was a, an attempt about 10 years after the last Combat Poverty Agency study to do a systematic follow-up, and I'm not sure what happened to that. Maybe some people here might be aware as to uh, what happened about that. So talking about um, poverty and social exclusion, um, as I say, I'm throwing out a lot of questions, a lot of questions that we need to work together on. Uh, while we talk about the differences, we always talk anytime different groups of NGOs or community groups or activists or people affected by problems come together, we always talk about our differences in compound characterization. In practice, as individuals, many of us are active in a number of different spheres, and I know a number of people here who have come across in quite a range of different campaigns, alliances, uh, different types of community work on the ground. And the same, uh, but we need to talk, as I say, more systematically about how they fit together. So I'm going to come back to where we normally start, which is with definitions. What do we mean by poverty? What do we mean by social exclusion? And how is this different or the same as discrimination and equality, which we don't normally talk about in these types of contexts? And I've got one minute to do that. <laughs> um, the official definition of poverty in Ireland, which has been adopted at European level, but was originally came out of an Irish initiative 40 years ago, uh, setting up the poverty, the poverty programs is, uh, I'm not going to give you the full quote, but effectively means that poverty means not having the resources and uh, to participate fully in society, to live the type of, of um, lifestyle that's considered acceptable within that society. And it's normally measured in Ireland in two different ways. Uh, one is in terms of um, what's known as the risk of poverty indicator, we used to call relative poverty, which is the number of people who are, whose income is less than 60% of the equivalent median income, and I won't be able to explain that in one minute. Um, and the, uh, the other definition is a more absolute definition, which is about deprivation, whether you, how many people in the society cannot afford two pairs of shoes, cannot afford to heat their home, and so on. What we've seen in the recession is a dramatic rise in deprivation. During the boom years, we didn't see Ireland becoming more equal. Ireland continued to be, to be one of the most equal societies in Europe, so relative poverty was very different. Social exclusion falls somewhere in the um, borderland between um, measures of poverty, which are mostly about resources, not just money, because resources can be healthcare, they can be education, they can be transport systems, and so on, uh, but um, uh, somewhere in the uh, in the overlap between uh, poverty and equality and discrimination. And it's in this overlap, I think, that we've been exploring today, and it's in this overlap that most of the questions we need to, uh, to ask are now. I think it would generally be accepted, for example, that not all travellers live in poverty, which is very much about resources and money, but pretty well all travellers in Irish society are socially excluded because of the way in which Irish society is structured and the way in which discrimination and um, uh, racism operate. Uh, and I think by analogy, we should look maybe at the way in which uh, poverty, social exclusion, discrimination and equality overlap among LGBT communities, but also individuals who, as a number of people have said, are affected by inequality, discrimination, by poverty and by deprivation in a whole range of different ways. and whose needs are not being addressed by policies at national, local or European level because we haven't organised together to put those policies on the agenda. And as the community sector is being decimated by cuts during, uh, during this recession, as people have referred to, I'm almost finished now, as people have referred to the closing down of many, many of the ways in which people in the past were able to get support to organise themselves and to organise their own communities, that type of community development is being closed down, replaced by service delivery from on high, 
uh, as the resources uh, are being grabbed more and more by higher income groups in the recession and unemployment is rising and uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, uh, deprivation is increasing quite dramatically even in a number of years. As all of these changes happen, we do need to find the sort of cooperation and unity that Susie was uh, talking about earlier, but not a simplistic unity that just brings us out all that behind the same banner, so I'm sure we do, we do that quite a lot, but a thoughtful unity that looks at the overlap between different issues and the way in which the same people can be affected by a whole range of different issues, which at the moment are labelled in very different ways in terms of the organisations which take them up and in terms of the uh, national policies. So I'm ending up with a lot more questions than answers because we don't have any answers at this stage, but housing exclusion is all about starting to bring out those sort of questions.